Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this HESED webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this event. My name is David Wortley. I'm the Virtual Conferences Director of IOMA. i just very briefly about our IOMA. IOMA is an independent global consumer commerce centre, which provides advice and guidance of an independent nature to governments and organisations to help them deal with the tremendous changes that are taking place in business and society as a result of the technology. Personally, I have had a background uh, in immersive learning uh, technologies. I was the founding director of the Serious Games Institute at Coventry University. So I've been involved in learning technologies for quite a number of years, but this event is not about uh, me. It's about our wonderful set of uh, panelists, uh, expertly moderated by uh, Juliana Oleinka. So I'm going to disappear from view very shortly, and I'm going to ask Juliana uh, to introduce the event and all of our expert uh, uh, panellists. David, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us on a, a cold morning in London. I know everybody is across the world, especially when we're all getting webinar fatigue. You've been holding on, and thank you, because this is such an important discussion, particularly for me. I'm a mother of three young children, and I know, you know, trying to juggle um, home learning with a pandemic, with uh, working, has been really, really tough. But there is light at the end of the tunnel, there hopefully will be a vaccine at the end of the year. But as we have seen, there are some uh, remnants of COVID-19 that will last for a long time. And one of them is the education space and how we educate our children. As with e-health, I think ed tech or education technology as it's called, really received a boost uh, during the pandemic, not just in the global north, uh, but in the global south, um, there are lots of discussions about ed tech uh, uh, companies, you know, surging, making so much money. Um, but uh, there is another side to the discussion, and that's the millions, hundreds of millions of uh, children across Africa that just uh, cannot get access uh, to um, education online. They don't have access to digital infrastructure. And we're going to ask some of these questions today with the expert panel about whether or not a copy and paste method of uh, Global North uh, practices are good in the South. We want to look at some of the supplementary learning methods, some alternative learning methods, some transformative learning methods. And we also want to look at um, the economic picture and whether or not this is viable and uh, sustainable. Uh, so I will be introducing my panel. Or just to let you know, I am a broadcast journalist. Um, I'm a business correspondent for Channels Television. I also work uh, pretty closely with David Wortley. David, thank you. He's helping us in the background. Um, and John Rainford, who is a, another panel. Uh, we work for Ioma, which is a consumer commerce center. But today, uh, this isn't about Ioma, it's about the children and it's about Hesed Learning and Development. Hesed Learning and Development um, is actually founded and developed uh, by a pretty well known man called Matthew Odu, who joins us on the panel today. And Matthew Odu is actually a chartered accountant by day and an uh, educator superman uh, by night. Um, he uh, used to work uh, with KPMG. Um, he now runs his own accountancy firm and works very closely uh, with the Commonwealth Office in London, which is how I um, was introduced to him, as well as some pretty well-known Nigerian diplomats um, across uh, the world. So thank you, uh, Matthew Odu, for putting this on and, um, you know, uh, hosting such an important discussion. I won't do what we typically do when we're on a Nigerian webinar and spend 20 minutes going through the profiles and bios of everybody but they certainly are worth mentioning um, firstly I'd like to mention a fellow female on the panel uh, Polly Alakaja um, somebody who I really respect and admire from afar and um, Polly is an author she's an artist she's an illustrator uh, she's somebody who has given up uh, much of her time uh, to uh, work with and develop and nurture the minds of young uh, boys and girls across Nigeria she 
actually is also the Lagos State Commissioner for Arts and Culture, a Lagos State being uh, the um, uh, economic capital of um, Africa. So we're very, very lucky uh, to have her here with us. Um, John Rainford also, John Rainford is a transformative thinker, innovator, and technology leader, as well as an educator and a mentor, somebody who I've learned so much from over the past um, a, a few months. Um, John is also uh, the creator of the Darwin Matrix, which I would really love him to speak with us in depth about um, today. The Darwin Matrix is a phenomenal um, a, a, a way of uh, learning and developing not just skills for children, but skills in the boardroom and just thinking out of the box, you know, not uh, being constrained to um, uh, some of the established learning methods. So we'll be hearing a lot about uh, that from him. And then uh, finally, we have Sadiq Ladd. Sadiq is one of, he's a partner and one of the founding members of LEK's Consulting's Global Education Practice with expert knowledge on Africa. I've had the pleasure of interviewing uh, Sadiq on uh, my business show, Channels Business Global, give that a quick plug, uh, which airs on Friday afternoons on Channels Television, Nigeria's number one station um, and I've also spoken to him and heard uh, from him on webinars such as these so we've got a great panel so thank you all very much um, there will be an opportunity towards the end and um, for a Q&A there is a chat box so please do put uh, your questions suggestions comments and um, yes we're just going to flow um, I want to start with you Steve I want to start with you because I want to have a, a kind of picture just give us um, a flavor of what um, the education sector on Africa looked like pre-pandemic, what you're hearing or picking up from during the pandemic and what we can expect 2021 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana. Uh, first of all, thank you for the kind introduction and, um, and welcome to all the panelists as well as audience. Um, what we will start with, as you, as you said, is, is just, just painting a broad overview and a picture of where we see the impact and what are some of the shifts or broader trends one could expect uh, more generally in emerging markets and, and how Africa is likely to be similar or, or different. So I'll just stop, you know, sort of taking a step back, given that it's, a, it's, it's an overview that you've asked me to give. So clearly on the adoption of technology in education, uh, use, of, use of tech has, has increased across, right? Though it was a forced experimentation, it has resulted in some shifts which are likely to be more permanent than just a momentary blip. Uh, the, the second thing here is education is a broad sector. There are about 15 to 20 sub-segments within education and uh, it will be you know there'll be sectors which will see this impact on a greater scale and uh, we will see that parents and students will be consuming more online across but greatest shifts are likely to be observed in supplementary education when we say supplementary education we are talking about tutoring language learning coding in the K through 12 context or the school uh, age population. And then uh, on the tertiary side, we will see greater adult education, online reskilling and upskilling. Uh, what, does, what does technology mean for traditional education system? And this is one of the big questions um, in minds of most of our clients, as well as you know, a lot of uh, companies or operators in the education space. So, as uh, I mean, you know, uh, we don't want to be presumptuous here, but of course, brick and mortar businesses are are here to stay. They will, we will see them embracing technology and embedding it with their own products, which are more brick and mortar. Uh, you will also see that, uh, and and in the pandemic, what we have actually seen is uh, big has turned out to be beautiful in the sense that those who have had the opportunity to invest in technology in some form, just by the sheer scale, because of sheer scale, they have been less impacted and they're likely to benefit even going forward. But for brick and mortar education, one key theme that all of us will hear is value for money. 
right? There is an increased focus on value for money in education, and as a result, you will also see that some amount of unbundling could happen from education as a broader project and a uh, product. And when we say unbundling, it could be pure play, uh, academics, after school products, um, you know, extracurricular activities, so on and so forth. Uh, then, then you know, I'll make one, two more points before uh, before we take this forward. Is 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 edtech arrived? Right? Is it is it that you know we have reached a frame where edtech is is working smoothly? Uh, not really. And and towards this end, we have been doing a lot of consumer research and first-hand discussions with parents, with students, both in the K twelve and higher education context. So there are a lot of challenges um, around two aspects. One is just teacher training and how providers can equip teachers much more to deliver a seamless um, um, online learning. And two, on the student engagement side, both from content as well as uh, delivery of education. Now, how does all of this and what will this mean specifically for Africa? While a lot of these themes are applicable to Africa, uh, Africa, given the low levels of tech adoption that that it saw, um, and and given that Africa also faces faces access issues, um, our belief is that provided some of the constraints are are met around infrastructure, where also we are seeing a lot of investments, um, Africa could actually leapfrog um, its journey from uh, and it need not go pure play brick and mortar first and then get to get to online or blended it could kind of like unlike asia it could leapfrog on that journey and and we have seen examples schools k12 schools they have started using uh, technology to help teachers and we see some mid price low cost options evolving there um, in after school learning of course you will see mobile based solutions which are helping through more um, uh, more after school uh, learning uh, the examples are NSA and PrEP uh, in East Africa, PrEP class in Nigeria. On the tertiary sector, we do see uh, sort of upskilling and adult education coming in a big way. And you also see providers like Moringa, Get Smarter, um, Unicaf working in this in this space and trying to, to, to leverage the opportunity of this shift towards online learning. So, so maybe I'll stop there, uh, Juliana, but hopefully this gives our, our audience and attendees a brief uh, overview of where we are seeing edtech in the context of education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adeep. Value for money, that's a really key, actually. I want us to go back on that because I'd like to know, you know, who is asking for the value for money? Is, is it the parents? Is it the students? Is it the investors? We'll come back to that shortly. Um, I want to go to you now, Polly. Polly is actually the chairperson of the Lagos State Council for Arts and Culture, not the commissioner yet. I don't know if she wants that title. <laughs> Um, but Polly, you hear some of the, the, the bits and pieces that uh, Sadiq was saying. How has this affected you and the, the thousands of children that you work with? Because, you know, judging by your social media, I'm going to predict that many of them just don't have access to this technology. Absolutely, Juliana, and thank you for the introduction and um, absolutely honored to be here. What an awesome panel. Um, I hope we're going to have longer than an hour because we've got so much to discuss. But absolutely, Juliana, you're right. Um, we do work in all sorts of different communities. Um, and I would say 90%, if not more, of our children that we work with are not online and have no hope of directly being online in the foreseeable future. Um, at best, there might be one smartphone per compound or one smartphone on the street. The next question is, does that smartphone have data? Um, invariably not. Data is very, very um, expensive here. It's even something I struggle with. I spend a ridiculous amount of money on data. So how on earth is somebody in Nasarawa State gonna fund data for their child to get online? It is not happening. Let alone our connectivity um, leaves a lot to be desired. Um, I'm in privileged decoy in Lagos and me and my team go crazy some days just trying to get some basic things done online. So we're very challenged technically and absolutely right, Juliana, our children are not online. So ordinarily pre-COVID, um, 
we work in communities across Nigeria. Um, most of the schools we work in are public schools, not exclusively, but the majority of them are. And our number one focus is to work directly with teachers and educators. We've, even pre-COVID, we started working in other areas with other community educators, not just strictly teachers from um, the formal educational sector. Um, so ordinarily, that's what we do. Um, and I think we're in total denial. Juliana, we just kept not wanting to see COVID coming at us like this train. Um, so even in February, we were still planning our workshops for the whole year. And in March then, oh, lo and behold, we um, grant an immediate halt. We were about to start a program with Lagos State Government at that point, um, a studio and a school concept. Um, and so when the train hit us and we all grand a halt, it was the Commissioner of Education that reached out to Five Carers, which is my little NGO, to say, okay, Polly, now what do we do? Now, how do we keep these young people engaged? Um, and actually for us, it was a really amazing and overdue wake up call. I've been in Nigeria for nearly 32 years um, and the same challenges. I came from wonderful privileged West London where I've been teaching and engaging the most privileged children um, and ended up, found myself in Nigeria and found myself in sort of baptism by fire, working in communities and in schools where children didn't have access to water, had to carry their desk to school, the, the roofs were leaking. So then so I had to question relevance and, and impact of everything that I had known before. Um, and those challenges and those issues that I met when I came to Nigeria, um, 1989, are the same challenges we have now, but quadrupled in scale. Um, and so over the years in my work with education, in education in Nigeria, working with teachers, working communities, all the resources I have to hand are European based or UK based or they're from the US. Very little is Nigeria centric or Africa centric. And it's always been our missing link. So which is almost manageable when you're doing direct learning and you have your educator, you have your teacher that you're working through to interpret and like change the narrative to make it locally relevant. What the lockdown enabled us to do was to stop dead in our tracks and think, okay, what is our missing link? And let's focus on that. And so when the commissioner challenged me to like, right, now what are we gonna do? I said, well, it's obvious. We have to get those resources developed and we have to make them accessible to children. Um, and so literally we have been working at breakneck speed ever since March. Um, putting together physical resources. Um, and at the beginning of lockdown, a lot of um, our potential sponsors were pushing us, oh, we have online platforms, give us content, we'll put it on our online platforms. And I kept saying, you're too much of a distraction, we can't do that because our children are not online. The children we serve, the communities we serve are not online and not gonna be online this year. So don't tell me you're gonna distribute iPads. My children we work with, need the physical resources. So at Brainnet Speed, we've been developing physical research resources, printing worksheets. And I have to say, private sector partners we have in this country, Juliana, you know, they are so awesome. I mean, I can't thank our private sector partners enough because in the midst of total nationwide lockdown, we were able to print out worksheets. We had um, a big um, logistics company, probably not allowed to advertise here. We in the middle of lockdown, were able to get these physical resources into the hands of children across the country. Now, what was interesting was these physical resources, just printed worksheets, very unelaborate with um, creative activities with a whole load of social behavioral change messaging embedded within it. So it's like, it was arts, it was creativity, but there were clear messages within it as well. And these worksheets, we had thought initially one worksheet per child, but then what actually happened was the worksheets were so um, enjoyed by the whole family that it was one worksheet per family. And what that made us realize hmm, is the need to work with entire families. Um, as you're aware, all of you, you know, the, actually the majority of Nigeria's children, even pre-COVID, are not in formal education. So even pre-COVID, we've lost most of our children. 
And so how do you access those children? So even before COVID, you know, the questions were there. What are we educating? How are we educating? How do we reach these out of school children? How do we reach these out of school young girls, the girls that get married when they're 12, 13, the girls that um, have teenage pregnancies and therefore will never go back into formal education. So we were already challenged with that. But then when we realized our worksheets were being so well received by the families, and those mothers and those aunties and the dads and the uncles all getting involved. We realized, right, we've got community education going on here. And those young mothers were key to it. Those young mothers might have been married when they were 14, might have two children by the time they're 18. They are still aspirational and they're key to engaging at community level with education. So Juliana, we've had such a thrilling time. It's been so exciting. We've learned so much. Anyway, so we've kind of almost become turned full circle. So whilst we were doing all of this, um, we were getting calls from people across the continent who wanted access to our resources. Um, again, we've been amazingly lucky with partners who have helped translate into different languages. We've had calls from Benin Republic, South Africa, Kenya, Zambia, across the continent. But not only that, Juliana, what I'm particularly thrilled about is um, educators in London, educators in the US who've got a lot of kids in their classrooms from the diaspora who need more contact with the continent. Yeah. Um, so we've been like, overwhelmed by interest in the resources. And I kept saying to all these interested third parties, like, do you want us to do like a South African version? Do you want us to do a Kenyan version? And overwhelmingly, in fact, everybody just immediately said, no, we, we love having this this story from Nigeria, telling the Nigerian story um, so our kids can really connect. Um, anyway, so as a result of all of that, the only way then to get these resources to these educators and to learners across the continent and beyond is digital. So we are now actually developing a digital platform, but it's very much, um, and it's going to be a really useful tool and we're having a lot of fun developing it because of course we can put 10 times more content on that than we can ever fit on i've actually got them here <laughs> um, <laughs> we can fit on our worksheets um so it's it's a very, it's going to be a very useful tool it's not the be all and end all but it will help us get the information out there and the resources out to a much broader audience um and interestingly hmm, we will now be working quite closely with UNICEF Nigeria to help them develop learning resources in partnership with federal government. So it's kind of interesting that um, we have been able to use arts and culture and learning through arts and culture to enhance the learning experience. Um, and it's that, Sudip was talking about um, supplementary learning. And that's what I talk about a lot. We have our national curriculum, and I have no doubt that working with federal government, helping them develop their resources, we're not interfering with the national curriculum. We're here to supplement that learning experience. Um, but then we're also here to make sure that learning can carry on in communities outside of the four walls of the classroom and with other educators. Um, that's the only, that's not the only way, but it is one way we can access um, all those kids that are are unlikely to get into formal education. Um, I can mention just one of many, many families we're in contact with, a family of 13 children, um, and the family can only afford to send three of the children to school. This is in the north of Nigeria. That family's economic situation is definitely not going to improve this year, next year, or the next five years. So they're only ever gonna be able to send three children to school. So what happens to the other 10 children? Um, we can't forget those children. So yeah we need to keep getting those resources out there alternative education we still need to see alternative supplementary education how are we going to package it um but you know i want to go back to what you said about leapfrogging as well and as you know this continent has this knack of leapfrogging you know and we go from one crisis to the next and that we stress without my goodness I me mean, can you imagine how we got to this point can it ever get any worse and how are we ever gonna get out of this situation? And then all of a sudden, boom, we leapfrog somewhere. Now, pre-COVID, um, we talk a lot in our um, arts education initiative about um, the skills we're trying to develop. It's, and I always go um, at length to explain to people that when we talk about arts education, it's not about trying to create a continent full of 
um, Ben and Monmus or Mini Picasso is about yeah, and it's about those soft skills that our employers need and that young people need to be empowered young people and have a safer world around them. And those soft skills, the four C's, communication, collaboration, critical thinking and creativity. That's what we were talking about before the pandemic came along. And even before the pandemic, the last um, column I wrote for the newspaper I do a column for, I was talking about some educators were starting to talk about 22nd century soft skills. And those 22nd century soft skills are very interesting. Keep in mind that people were talking about this pre-COVID and those soft skills, they're four C's as well. Um, their caring, their culture, their community, and they are compassion. So already pre-COVID, some educators had identified those skills as being key skills that we have been neglecting, that are at the heart of why we're educating and what we need to educate wow. for. And then along came COVID-19 and the communities that have responded best to this pandemic are the communities where those skills are still inherent in their culture. So then in a weird way, that's those those skills, those four C's are so embedded in our communities here. Our Nigerian communities, our communities in the North never lost those skills. It is still there. If you think about the Nigerian family structure, the Nigerian community, those skills are still there. So in a weird way, we're leapfrogging, but we're also taking a massive step you know, back. I, I just, so I'm, I'm, part of I'm, it was, it's those four C's, um, Polly, that I'm going to use to transition nicely onto John, uh, because uh, when we were speaking offline, I said emotive is John Rainford's favorite word, and it is, uh, because uh, John, Rainf John Rainford is um, the uh, founder of uh, the Darwin Matrix and using transformational learning and alternative learning methods. And I want to ask you, John, after listening to what Polly has said, do you think potentially um, investors or educators on the continent are wrong in trying to just copy and paste and adopt these learning methods, especially when it comes to ed tech and learning on WhatsApp and radio and TV, uh, when we could actually try some supplementary learning methods or learning through art and culture, uh, rather than just copying and pasting, which doesn't work. We saw it with the lockdowns in Africa. Over to you, John, thank you. Thank you, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Hopefully, good. Um, I'm very pleased of uh, what Polly has, has said, that um, it is more about the responsibility of the community rather than just individuals enhancing their own skill sets. I think it's um, everybody's responsibility, including government and, um, teachers uh, and, the, and of course the family. So the Darwin matrix really is, the idea behind it is holistic thinking and it embraces things like empathy and sort of soft skills as well. So it's actually uh, providing a, a, a bigger learning platform, which uh, if you like embraces the community as opposed to just focusing on the individual. So it's, it's actually, encouraging the individual to take responsibility for their own learning and well-being so it's like that responsibility can be somehow enhanced through developing creativity um, self-expression all those sort of things we need to bring it all together in other words we've got the technology the dual matrix uh, we've, we've got some technology that can improve holistic thinking but we also need to change the mindset of the the individuals and the community itself because i i've got some um students in india who are helping some um remote, remote villages where there's communities there and they haven't got any technology as such um but the the methodology which is actually heavily creative i must say and empathic um helps to, um the individuals to become much more capable, not just in the soft skills kind of sense, but wanting to love the love of learning, which I think we've lost somehow in schools. Um, we need to get that back so that, you know, children shouldn't be bored. They should be actually excited about 
the prospect of learning so much from you know whatever source it might be and I, I've got lots of ideas about how we can improve that and one of the reasons that we developed the Mark Darwin matrix is because it it actually enhances the learning process so when we're working with organizations like Shell if you don't bring the individual along with the collective will of the of the organization then it will it will in some respects fail in other words it has to be you've got to develop all the people and I think that that's the challenge that we've got I think education has gone down a in a, some respects a myopic route which doesn't really see like the, you know, we talk about copy and paste and so on it's yes it's worked for 200 years but actually we need to rethink the whole process and COVID-19 has accelerated that now so it makes the technology much more relevant it makes soft skills more relevant the ability to express ourselves through art and you know music and so on all of these factors can be used to um, enhance um, you know, pupils' prospects. So that's why I'm excited about the way, ev you know, the evolutionary process in, in, um, in education and also in the health, how that can all be changed. And I think we're, we're ready for that now. It's based on scientific, you know, neuroscience and systems thinking, which people like NASA use, Elon Musk, all the evidence is out there that there are better processes for learning. And that's where, why I got excited with um, the educational aspect of it, because, you know, um, places like Africa are, are, we can leapfrog, we can go into the future, um, you know, because actually we're not necessarily adopting the old practices of education, which can, can some ways be a hindrance to the way we might um evolve you know and i think this is this is the the point where we need to take advantage of COVID 19 and say well okay it's accelerated technology it's accelerated how we should learn and why we should learn and i think there's some deep questions we need to ask about organizations communities about how they can prosper both you know in a well-being aspect as well as financially and a lot yeah, of the can I, can sorry, John. To, sorry, John, I, I'm, I'm so sorry to cut you, but I do want to ask you something, actually, because I want to focus, if I can, very briefly on the disparities in uh, digital um, ac access and technology training for teachers. Now, there's a term we use on the continent a lot called the brain drain, where we've got really successful uh, medical doctors who, as soon as they can get a visa, they up and leave. One of them actually has been celebrated because he contributed to the Pfizer-BioNTech um, uh, of, of vaccination. Do you, do you foresee, because I know you're also a futurist, and an innovator, do you foresee any issues with the millions of young children learning, not through technology, but through the kind of uh, booklets that Polly has with catching up with the rest of the world or are there benefits from not being online? I think the, 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 there's a combination there that we, we need to embrace technology, but at the same time, some of the uh, basic skills of learning, which, which I think we've sort of ignored the creativity aspect, which is why I'm excited about what Polly's description about using art and, and music as a way of enhancing uh, individual prospects. So I think really we need to bring those things together, you know, the technology and actually rethink the way we learn and why we learn, because I think we're just doing almost like you were suggesting before, um, you know just just pasting things in place because it's always been done that way and i think this is a time for a rethink um you know what is our education system for uh, you know einstein said it's about um you know not about training about absorbing knowledge it's about actually training people to think and i think we need to go back to you know how, what is education for is it going to enhance a community or individual and, and if you like, get them to be inspirational about their, their objectives. So I think there's a lot of things, you know, which, which I think um, are tactile, you know, you need the notebooks, you need the, the interactions with real things, because that's what we know, you know, that's a sort of basic instinct. 
um, and then relate it to the environmental issues, which is what systems thinking is about. You know, what environment are you in? How can you um, either control the environment or at least respond in a positive way to the environment that you're in? And the bricks and mortar will still always have a place. Of course it will. Um, but I think that the community um, itself is actually more important than the bricks and mortar. So there's a lot of things to think through in terms of... It's, it's the blending, isn't it? It's the... the, 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 yeah. the Algamation of both of them, both methods. Um, Matthew Audio, I want to bring you in. Thank you, Sadiq, for answering all of our questions. We do have a Q&A box, um, and I will throw out these questions as well uh, to the rest of the panel. We're actually running out of time, but Matthew, uh, you are um, the host uh, from Hesed Learning um, and Development, and congratulations, because I know you and your wife have sacrificed so much, um, which led to uh, your son, um, uh, uh, enrolling into Cambridge University, which is one of the best universities in the world. And it was through that journey and just through seeing the stark differences between uh, growing up and studying in Africa and growing up and studying here and, um, you know, what you can get out of that. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about what a supplementary um, uh, training will be available on HESED Learning. And I want you, if you can, to, to comment on uh, Polly's comments about the uh, private sector. I know you've been in Nigeria quite a lot. How receptive are they to alternative methods? Um, for those of you who are not Nigerian, there has been some memes trending on WhatsApp uh, showing all of the best uh, lawyers and government officials sending their children to the best schools in Britain but not investing in their own schools, not allowing uh, their children to study there. Over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Juliana. I mean, um, uh, I want to say thank you to everyone for helping us on, on this webinar. You see, the, the thinking behind hazard learning and development is, it's not just about um, the depth of a, uh, quality or high standard education in Nigeria, for instance. There are quality tuition, quality education in Nigeria, but very well restricted. You know, you need to have, I mean, big access, you need to have big, big money to have the kind of quality education that can propel these children you know, to the level of their skill or the, the level of the, the latent um, skill that they have. So what HESED Learning and Development is doing is, I mean, we can actually call it distribution. We want to make quality education a lot more widely available to many instead of the, the restricted few. And how best can we do that than to leverage on technology? Because we are actually aware of the limitation of, uh, of access to technology in Nigeria, but those things are what we, we have to overcome because the way things are at the moment, you see, um, we will still have that pocket of few groups, you know, having the best of the education and the majority not having education at all. But, and again, rethinking the, the infrastructural need of education is important. We have bulging classes, we have almost 52% of our population within a secondary school age group. And with the restricted funding available in the country, I mean, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, it's not feasible to think in the next five, 10 years, we will have the structure in place, you know, like schools, traditional schools and other things. If there is anything that the COVID has highlighted to us is the fact that technology will continue to impact every aspect of our life as a nation. So education cannot really be um, left out of this constant changes that we, we will continue to experience. So what we are trying to do is to digitalize this quality education, you know, to make it uh, a very low cost access to many. Um, 
So we, by so doing, we think we can help in supporting the structure that we we have on ground. I mean, we are we are not uh, we are not suggesting that all education, I mean, technology will solve the education problem that we have in the country. No, number number one, we want a blended approach to this. The traditional system be in place, still have its place, uh, but we just need to rethink. And the way we do this is important. You see, you see um, like Margaret Mead said, he said, he said, if our children don't learn the way we teach, we have to teach the way they learn. You see, we have a group of young people now across the world in Africa too. They spend quite a lot of their time on internet. They consume videos. They do a lot of digital interactions. We don't meet them at that space to help them to learn. You see, I mean, the, the way they live is quite diverse from the way they have been taught. So if we merge the, the 21st century life that they live, if we merge it squarely with the, the, I mean, with the teaching system, I think we are going to get more fruitful results than we, we currently we, we currently experience. Absolutely. And particularly in Nigeria, uh, uh, Juliana, to us, we think, I mean, education should, should not just be a social investment. To us, it should be a national security matter because if we don't get this youthful population educated now, we are going to have the blowback from the negative effect. You're, 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 you're completely right, and we've seen that. I, I didn't want to mention the hashtag NSARS, especially to Polly, um, because she's just five minutes away from where it all uh, kicked off. But clearly, this is the result of a, a pent up frustration. Um, I think I've got enough time for just one question for each of our panelists. Sadeep, I want to come back to you. OK, so I've got a little bit of a stat here. This is from Ed Tech Hub. Um, they have a database um, which looks at um, ed tech products on the continent. Um, of course, we saw a surge in usage. And um, during the pandemic, they had 19 million regular users. That's a massive boost. But there are 450 million children aged 14 or younger on the continent. So that's less than a 5% uptake. What is happening with these children that are not... Um, having access to digital infrastructure. They are the majority of people. How is the private sector investing in their education? It, it can't be all about ed tech. We've seen Polly's um, booklet. I'm sure Polly will be able to share that with us so we can all do some of that homework. Um, but, but, but are there discussions about those individuals or are we just expecting them to adopt this infrastructure or be left out, which is the fear of many? Sure, Juliana. I think, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, the, the, one of the most pertinent issues for governments, uh, foundations, as well as uh, a lot of impact investors. So, um, so increasingly, you know, while on one side, the pure play for profit sector has uh, has sort of invested in technology started um, you know selling their products at the same time um, those focused on not for profit or impact have also been promoting investments in technology right um, for example leading foundations like jacobs foundation who uh, who do work in in in, in the african context uh, have increasingly started funding or promoting technology-based based models. Uh, a lot of these governments and foundations are also trying to develop initiatives whereby they can use the private sector. So it is, it is engaging private sector, but towards a broader uh, sort of, you know, cause. And, um, and, and to that extent, we are seeing some investments even by multilaterals around uh, the, the likes of World Bank, IFC, USAID, around um, rolling out digital skilling programs, which, um, which will not just help uh, you know, teachers 
but also the broader set of um, employment market out there or, or young adults who can then be sort of you know employed and um, and and be in the mainstream of of technology because from here on we will increasingly see a skill gap when it comes to technology um and and so even in, in in the african context some of the universities right what they have done in the in the time of covid is that they have um, they had they had they had contracted with telecom operators to provide zero access to to their sites and to their content right so that students even in remote areas have some facility to access it um clearly i mean this is this is a large problem uh, a sc really scale problem to solve and it will require a uh, more thinking more innovation uh, across all all parlance and it's not just about sort of talking about private versus public but they will have to work um you know complementary to each other to devise solutions uh, at scale thank you thank you sadeep there's there's a question here that i'd like uh, both uh, polly um, and John to pick up from me. It's from uh, Bolatito Lawal. How do we intend to train public school teachers? Really important question as well to use these digital devices to blend teaching and learning with the face-to-face -face practice. I understand training should commence with the teachers and a lot of children fall within this category. It's true, even some of us, like I don't have a TikTok account. I desperately want to have one, but I don't know how to do it. Like how do we start teaching these um, teachers, Polly, John, how have you been doing it? You're both muted. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, training the trainer is vital, right? Um, and as I said before, pre-COVID, that was our main focus, was training the trainer. And how we did it was physically. We did physical workshops, actually because we feel that that's how our trainers learn best. And because we're dealing with tactile experiences, we're dealing with physical materials that a lot of our teachers haven't really used before. Our physical workshops are really key. And they're also really awesome experiences for everybody. So once you've like run one of these workshops with these teachers and the teachers understand that actually your first port of call is investing in the teacher you've got them signed up for life, yeah? So it's this, we always stress when we work with teachers, they're so used to the focus always being the child, the child, the child. We always say, no, we're investing in you. We want to develop your creative skills. If you're not creative, you're not gonna be able to creative in the classroom. So the moment they really understand that, there's always a light bulb moment. You've got them committed and they become excited and they become truly engaged. So for us, it is challenging to like, drop the physical workshops um, and have to engage online. But it's been interesting um, the last eight months, we've continued to work with our teachers and our community liaison officers online. Um, I have to say it's challenging to keep their enthusiasm going and to keep them um, really engaging with us because of connectivity. So literally we all have weekly Zoom meetings with everybody and half of our teachers and our educators struggle to get online to join the Zoom meetings. So it is very challenging, but absolutely we need to focus on training the trainer. Um, we are a very small NGO as Five Carries, but we partner with third party delivery partners um, who address the online um, training. Um, and one of the partners we work with, the organization called One Million Teachers, um, um, they work closely with Queen's University in Canada and they offer um, all their teachers, a lot of them public school teachers, upskilling through connecting to their programs online. Um, so the teachers sign up for it um, and are engaged and committed because they know they're going to upskill and that they're going to get better qualifications and become more valuable em um, employees. Um, but it is a challenge. I don't have a total solution, Juliana, but absolutely the focus is training the trainer. It's always got to be training the trainer, which is why I said with community learning, whilst we're creating these resources that we want to be used by the whole family, the key person in the equation is that aspirational young mother in the compound, in the home. So she almost becomes our trainer within the family. So that person is always the key person. And in different situations is a different role and a different person. We've also worked in hospitals and community health centers. Um, and there we work with community health workers. So it's always identifying who has the trust of the community in which you're working. 
Is it the young mother? Is it the community liaison officer? Is it the teacher? Whoever's got the trust of the community, that's who you have to invest in. And the nuances those... are so the nuances are so strong, mm. aren't they, on the continent? There's yeah. so much. It's not just the headline. It's being exactly. on the ground and understanding. I want yeah. to pass over to John. We've only got eight minutes left, so we'll go over to John and then I, I'll, I'll speak to Matthew. Uh, I think it's really important to have these uh, innovation workshops, which in, you know in, engages the teachers, without a doubt. That's that's really way. If you can actually use the workshops, which I've done, um, and then translate it into a digital platform, and maybe you could record the whole event then you, you can actually then pass that on to, because I know that young people like videos and learning from videos. So you might be able to pass that that on so it's recorded and then you, you're passing on that, that knowledge through uh, an audience. Uh, and it could be like, um, you know, a, a mass audience where you've got a, a lot of families all learning from from that, that uh, experience. So I think the value of workshops are really powerful, but also, um, with the Darwin Matrix, we translated a board, if you like, that people use, a creative board, and that is replicated online. So this is where there's a power of blended learning. I think that's quite, quite uh, useful to explore that. John, you mentioned um, some of the work you, you had done in India. When you're going to, uh, you know, different uh, communities, different countries, uh, do you do you bear in mind the culture, the cultural differences and the approach? Well, that's that's key, isn't it? I mean, you, you've got to, um, uh, you know, have a, a learning platform which looks at um, cultural differences. I think that's quite, quite um, key to, with this empathy approach, which is lo looking at the differences of, of people and try to define the language that we use. Is it adequate and maybe sometimes you know words can be very clumsy so we need to make sure like for example we know what innovation means or we have a good idea collectively what creativity means we have a good idea what you know mathematics means so we're looking at algorithms we're looking at ways of identifying how we can um cross over the barriers of understanding because really it comes back to understanding and thinking aspirational Absolutely. Um, uh, Sadeep, I want to ask you a question just before we start uh, to wrap up. You, you mentioned in your opening statement about value and value for money. And that's one of the key themes uh, for investors on the continent. What does value for money look like? Um, because, you know, I, I can't tell you how many uh, cleaners or people I've seen out of the job um, on the continent who have studied engineering, they've got a master's degree in engineering. I, I presume that education is not value for money if there are no jobs at the end of it. Is it about jobs or is it about so much more? Yeah, so I think it works, um, um, you know, depending on the segment that we are talking about. So the first one is on the schooling side, right? Basic schooling, early years, uh, secondary schooling. Um, what parents are increasingly thinking, you know, when they are re-enrolling or enrolling their uh, their children in schools is, um, you know, what is the real value I'm getting by enrolling my child in a school which charges, let's say, uh, $1,000? What extra am I getting um, in the school versus, you know, let's say a school which charges, um, you know, $500, um, just, just as an example. So they are increasingly considering, and in some cases, they are also trying to trade down in the sense that you know, in times of economic boom, they had uh, you know they had access to a um, to, to to a fund, and uh, and they enrolled in more mid price premium schools. They are reconsidering some of those decisions, and you know, while education is not purely like any other consumer product, typically it is the last one that household wants to touch. Uh, but still, increasingly for, for new parents, given that there will be some hit in affordability over the next two years, three years, we will see increasing focus of, on value for money by parents. And on the, on the tertiary side, as you rightly said, uh, value for money actually has a, has a connotation of employability or uh, payback period, which is you know, return on, on the investment that you've put into higher education. So, so there the consideration is, do I need to do this two-year degree 
and and still be out of job for that time because there's an opportunity cost or can i just do a skilling course right which let's say you know data data sciences and which immediately puts me into an industry role for my skills so you will see that shift of focus on skilling as opposed to pure play um you know degrees thank you sudeep we just got two or three minutes uh, left uh, just i'll have one last comment uh, from each of you first of you mathy because you've spoken the least um talk to us a little bit about some of the projects you're doing over the next 12 months how we can partner with you and help you oh my goodness i want to help polly so much i'm always whatsapping saying let me help let me help but this is about the kids isn't it it's about the kids it's about their future and how we can assist and how we can also assist sadeep and lek because of course they're giving out this information about the continent um, and we know much of this information over to you matthew very briefly please yeah thank you julina I think what I mean, what we we are trying to to do, I mean, to play uh, a supporting role um, to the education system as it is now, you know, because we um, I mean, we've come to the uh, to the understanding that you know the the problem in our education system is is now as it is is teaching, I mean, the youth of twenty first century with 19th century mindset, you know. I mean, there's a mismatch in that. You know, children still go through the school. They are well, I mean, loaded with information, but the, I mean, the mind is not as open, you know, to the challenges, the, the why not? Why don't you do this? The, the, the questioning, it's not there. You know, we still have, just like Sadiq said, we have the issue of employability. We have the, the skill that is needed to succeed out there are not being taught, you know, uh, widely. So those are the things we want to plug into. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Brilliant. John, John, if you can just let us know about uh, uh, ways that we can get in touch and partner and uh, what your plans are in 2021 under the Darwin Matrix umbrella. Well, I think it's uh, really about blended learning. It's bringing a rethink about you know how we learn, why we learn in, in a particular way. We need to push creativity back into the mix. We need to link that creativity with digital, the digital platform, which is what the Dog Matrix is all about. It's actually marrying the two together, and I think that will then help um, young young people. Um, look to a better future really because it Thank is you, John. Really John, this is the third time i'm cutting you i'm so sorry i'm gonna just polly i'm giving you the last word oh goodness me i am gonna go back to that family i mentioned of 13 children and only three went to formal ed or are in formal education and it is considered that the other 10 are not being educated. So number one, all those children in that family go to an Islamic school in the evenings and learn Arabic and learn lessons in Arabic. Number two, of those 10 children who are not in formal education, one does the most extraordinary embroidery. One works with a carpenter, one works with a cobbler. So Sudeep, I'm absolutely with you. It's about those skills that are gonna empower these young people what are we educating and why are we educating? And Juliana, back to what you're saying, you wanna help. Please, you all need to help, you all need to be involved. And I think the timing is extraordinary. We could not have written the script of 2020. We had COVID-19, we had Black Lives Matter, we had NSARS. Our young people, if it's a six-year-old child in Borno State, if it's a 23-year-old creative designer in Lagos, they need to be connected with our global narratives and know their roles and responsibilities within that global narrative. Oh, thank you, Polly. Just on time, thank you all so much. It was just an hour. I'm so sorry. I know we kind of dipped our toe and came out, dipped our toe, but it's only an hour and it's education. So much to discuss. Uh, Follow Care says, can we have the replay of this webinar? I lost connectivity. You absolutely can. Adjiboye is saying, what can your organisation do to help the Nigerian education? We're going to get in touch with you all. Thank you all uh, so much. Um, John Rainford, Matthew Odu, Sadiq Ladd, Polly Alakija, David Wortley uh, behind the scenes. We will try to repeat this discussion. Once again, it was only an hour webinar fatigue, but we pushed through it. Have a lovely day, everybody. Thank you all so much. And everybody do stay in touch. Thank you all.
Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much to all our panelists. I've thoroughly enjoyed sitting in the background listening to you all and uh, uh, it's a great update for me um, uh, with what's happening in, in Africa uh, and I can empathise with many of the things that I've heard today. So for all our delegates, thank you very much for joining today. Um, would you please um, uh, log off now uh, so that we can have a little debrief with our, uh, our panellists. Thank you. I am going to be live on air in less than 30 minutes, so I must run away. I must run away, my dear fellow panellists. I will be available on email, and there are still some people that can hear me. Uh, so you can catch me on Channels TV talking about the FTSE 100. Um, but I will catch up with anybody else on email. Thank you all so much. It was absolutely wonderful. David, thank you for your assistance. My pleasure. Juliana. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you everybody for joining this afternoon. Um, I think you did a, a, a great job. I, I found it very, uh, very interesting my, myself. Uh, any of you got any questions? Um, we are we are still live on YouTube, so I, I should uh, end.